Resurrected Republic, Truth Radio Broadcast on RBN, the Republic Broadcasting Network, because you can handle the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, Resurrected Republic Truth Radio broadcast. Moments ago, I just conducted an interview with Ryan Bundy, um, who's running for Nevada governor. Hey, I'm on the line with uh, Ryan Bundy. Ryan, it's, it's good to have you with us. Um, good to be there, Tom. So, <laughs> Very excited about your, uh, your race for governor. Um, uh, I've been waiting. I've been t- trying to be patient. I know you've been so busy lately. There's so many things going on. Um, but uh, can you tell us how that, that race, how it's coming along? Well, we're moving along. Like I said, uh, we've got lots of support, and we're gaining more every day. Um, and uh, I don't know, doing lots of interviews, lots of lots of schedules, a few opportunities to speak. I'd like a few more of those, but... Uh, there's a bunch of invitations coming up and a bunch, bunch of events that are going to happen in the in the next couple of months. A lot of county fairs and and uh, uh, meet and greets and different opportunities like that. I'll be attending. Yeah. There, well, uh, I hope uh, to catch maybe a couple of those maybe. <laughs> well, yeah. well, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's been a little bit slow in the summer, which it's kind of always that way. You know, you get through the primaries at the first of June. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, June, July, August, there's a little bit of a time to, to rest in one way, but uh, people are vacationing and paying attention to their lives, and then in the fall, they start things start kicking up again. So yeah, well, you know, you are, uh, and everybody who, who knows you knows that you're, you're conservative, but you you place principles over party. And I think that that is one of the most refreshing and necessary things, especially for governor. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what makes you a little bit different than the, the uh, in crowd? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you up straight that I understand the proper form of government and the proper purpose for government. And it seems like, it seems like none of the other candidates do, but very, very few men and women in political positions understand that, and that's in a, in a sad reason why we're in such a terrible shape as we are. And oh, yeah, I, they're, they're fighting to spread our democracy. <laughs> yeah, our democracy, exactly. <laughs> that's just a problem. Um, yeah. Being that our founding fathers established a republic and guaranteed a republican form of government mm-hmm. in, in, under Article 4, um, of the Constitution, and yet uh, I, I hear all the time that we're a Republican or no such thing. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, uh, they spread it across the world. You know, these, I haven't heard too many governors actually quote from the Constitution in interviews or presentations. It's a, it's a refreshing thing uh, to, to hear. Um, and, you know, I don't even, I don't, I, I know that uh, there's been a lot of, uh, harsh press when it comes to the left I don't think these folks realize that what you're advocating for could greatly benefit their lives and this is what so frustrates me with the uh, mainstream media coverage do you think you could tell me a little bit as governor what you could do that would that would benefit the, the constituents of your state on maybe both sides well yeah but you know <clears throat> I believe that adhering to you know, correct form and purpose of government uh, is beneficial to everybody. It's not a it's not a party beneficial one side or the other. It, it benefits all of us um, because it creates an environment of liberty where we can thrive if we, you know, have the innovation or the entrepreneurial, you know, uh, attitude to go about and to provide for ourselves. It, it opens that up. Now, Someone who wants to live under socialism and communism, well, it doesn't help them because uh, you know if, if they're not going to step up and get out and do something for themselves, well, nobody thrives under that. And, uh, and, and unless you're a socialist trying to 
staff off of other people's work. Right. Well, that, that's been my kind of my complaint with the with such of the the uh, control uh, central planning style control of the federal government in the western states. Um, you know, we've seen in town after town after town. Uh, for for instance, Grant County in Oregon used to be one of the most prosperous counties in Oregon, uh, and then. Uh, all of these regulations and government, uh, federal government management basically destroyed Grant County. Now they're, they're one of the poorest. And you know, this was one of the biggest complaints of the sheriff there, that he was, he was just fit to be tied about, you know. And, and uh, I'd like to see that change. Is there any way that we can uh, put a proper check and balance on the federal government on the state level? Yes, of course we can, and that was that is what has not happened for many years. The, the checks and balances are not taking place. But yes, the state governments, if they would recognize their proper place, which is you know a legitimate uh, state that had entered on equal footing with the original 13 states, the state that can exercise and and acknowledge its sovereignty, that it is not a subdivision of the federal government, but is rather an independent state. Now, you know, we as states in the United States have joined a union, and we're grateful to be a part of that union, and that union is supposed to be, is supposed to benefit us as states. But what we've become is just subdivisions of the federal government, and, and so the states can, if they will, check the federal government by inserting, asserting their their sovereignty as a state. Um, and along with that comes the, you know, the, the, the claim and control of the land within its borders. Mm. Um, yeah, and that so, would be a beautiful thing. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I, that, I, you know that, I have to tell everybody, if you become governor, I'm moving to Nevada. <laughs> well, I've heard that a lot, actually, lately. I, you know, I, maybe I'll need to move here first so that uh, you can vote for me and I will become governor. Make it yeah. Easier, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing, man. All right, so as, you know, as your role of governor, what do you think that you can change in Nevada right now, or what do you think that you could work to change in Nevada right now that accomplishes some of these uh, goals? Well, <clears throat> kind of already said that to some degree, but you know, immediately yeah. I will I will recognize that Nevada is a sovereign state. I will start making you know steps to uh, make that a reality rather than just a theology or a, a figment of our imagination at the point. Um, but you know, another one of my important points is the judicial system. Um, the, the trials that are going on on a federal level that are outside the jurisdiction of federal courts, um, I'll yes. put a stop to that. Uh, you know, just, just so people understand, you know, our federal government only has what power we've given it. That is made clear in the Tenth Amendment. And so when we look at the judicial powers of the United States, we give that, we give the federal government uh, a judicial powers in Article Three of the Constitution. In Article 3, Section 2, it lays out the, the several jurisdictions that we allow the federal court to have. And there's six of them. There's only six jurisdictions that they have. And, that, and of those six, all of them are civil jurisdictions. The federal government does not have jurisdiction over criminal matters. Criminal matters um, are a state jurisdiction issue. And, and so... The federal courts exercising or prosecuting crime is unconstitutional, except in the case of impeachment. That's how the Constitution reads. Right. Otherwise, uh, a, a man who is accused of a crime is to be tried in the state and in the district, which is a subdivision of the state, not District of Columbia. Uh, in other words, not in a federal district, but in a state district. Uh, mm -hmm. One who is accused has the right to be tried in the state and the district, 
in which he was the alleged client of crime had taken place. And he is to be tried by a jury of the state. Now, of, the word of means deriving from or belonging to. And so that jury must be a state jury, not a federal jury, not a jury called up by a federal court. And so mm. both the, the Article Three and the Sixth Amendment make it clear that all crimes are to be tried on a state level. And yet mm. we have so many that are being tried on a federal level. Uh, well, I, they're, the they're misusing, I think uh, Chris Ann Hall talks about this too, it seems to me they're, they're way misusing the original intent of the Commerce Clause to accomplish a large part of that, uh, that nonsense. Um, but that's just one aspect. You know, another aspect that kind of concerns me, um, yeah. okay, sorry about that. We got cut off. But, All right. Well, um, yeah, that's, uh, I'm, I'm traveling, uh, as I told you, I'd be stuck in. Yeah. Um, oh, that's, that's okay. We'll take you, we'll take you any do. way we can get you, brothers. You, as busy as you've been, I'm glad that I can get you on the way to somewhere. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's sometimes the best for me to talk is in transit. No. Okay, so, so so where were we? Um, oh, yeah, the interruption. Um, the, the boundaries uh, uh, of, of the federal government and the state government and jurisdiction and prosecuting crimes, um, you know, one of the things I was about to ask you was uh, I've heard that now they're challenging again the Ninth Circuit uh Court of Appeals, this this decision to, uh, which was you know they they dropped this case and and with prejudice too. Um, there's willful withholding of, of evidence. This is just this is your case, but this is happening in so many other cases that it's it's relevant like across the board. Willful withholding sure. of evidence, destruction of evidence, crimes that are being committed by these federal prosecutors, and. I have I kind of have a question. If a federal prosecutor breaks a law and and it lies in a court, now I know that they're claiming federal jurisdiction in the matter, right? But is there any way to, to for a governor or for the uh, his his appointees to to take uh, some sort of action against that crime? Well. Uh... There's, I'll have to look into that, but there certainly should there should be. I mean, if there's a crime been committed, then there's a crime been committed. If he's right. in the, the state of Nevada, then uh, then turn and prosecute him for the for the crimes he's committed. Yeah, so that's, I know that they're claiming jurisdiction in Nevada, but uh, they have never have established jurisdiction. See, now that's the other thing about jurisdiction in a, in a court. In a, in, a, in a court case, any court case, whether it be civil or criminal, as soon as jurisdiction is challenged, then that challenge must be answered and satisfied to establish jurisdiction. And until such a, a, such has taken place, the, the case is supposed to come to a complete standstill. Nothing's supposed to happen because if they don't have jurisdiction, to administer the case, then they have no authority to do anything other than to dismiss the case. Right. Um, and so I challenged jurisdiction, and never have they answered it. I, it wasn't just one challenge. I actually made three different types of jurisdictional challenges, mm -hmm. um, and, and they simply went unanswered. The, the judge just dismissed or she struck them from the record as moot. In other words, she refused to answer them. And so yeah. the, you know, the federal court simply does not have jurisdiction here. And because they could not answer that question favorably in their, uh, in, uh, to their need, to their desire, mm -hmm. they simply went about to ignore them. Um, yeah. But still, they do, not have, they do not have lawful jurisdiction in the matter. And, and the problem is, is that nobody is holding them accountable um, for operating under the presumption and assumption that they mm -hmm. do. And so, again, that's why we need a, a strong state government to make that check and that balance. And so there is a way to go about that, and the, the governor has the authority to make that happen. And yeah. so, again, that's why I am running for governor um, in part. 
You know, I, I've had conversations with people of both right and left persuasions in Nevada since you uh, started running for governor. And, um, I, you're starting to resonate with more people than I think that you're even aware of. Uh, um, there are people, on, and like you said, that this is principle over, over party. There are people on both sides of the political spectrum uh, that are just absolutely fed up with certain uh, aspects of this federal government, like this land management. It's still the perpetuated lies going on, uh, you know, about all of these ranchers, not just, not just your dad, but many of these ranchers, um, 50 of them were in, in that county that, that your dad's in. And it just, to me, people are starting to see when there were 50 ranchers and, and you got one left, that's an agenda. That's not, um, uh, that's not just government regulation. That's that's government using economic terrorism against the people. Now, my argument with that is, is when we catch and we have caught employees plotting and planning to do this, like no uh, cattle free in '93, no more new moon in '92. This, these are agendas. This essentially becomes, at, at that point, um, ideologically driven, but it, it becomes a corrupt criminal organization. And when two or so or more people conspire to cheat somebody out of their land, whoever makes makes the, the profit, whether it's the government or whether it's a private corporation or whether it's an individual, it's still a criminal conspiracy, is it not? Yeah, certainly it is. You know, they want to charge us with criminal conspiracy, but where, you know, to impede a federal officer from you know, conducting <laughs> his work, but, but yet they've been involved with in a conspiracy for years to mm -hmm. uh, eliminate the ranchers and the producers off the land. And so... Um, you know, anyway, yeah, our yeah. conspiracy was obviously proven untrue, and yet here's continues mm -hmm. on unprosecuted because, you know, hey, they're all in the game together. So, oh, they got to be, they got to be uh, uh, shaking a little bit for your run. <laughs> I hope they're well, a little bit nervous. <laughs> I finally have maybe some law and order in the state of Nevada for real. That would be nice. Yes, nice. well, that's that's what uh, that's what will take place. So. Yes, sir. Well, um, we talked a little bit uh, before about uh, this case with this FBI agent involved in the trial that's going on right now with the uh, United States versus Pastor Rita, which I think is important. Although I don't think that he's being charged with the appropriate uh, amount or severity of. Of crimes, I hate to make one or two guys the scapegoat because there are certainly people at a higher level that were pulling some strings there. But you, you were there, and, and of course, uh, in the truck and, and, and took one in the shoulder. Can you tell us a little bit about what what you know about that case for our audience? Well, you know, the case they are charging Joseph Astorita with, uh, you know, lying more or less to to the superiors about shots that he fired. He claimed that he didn't shoot any shots, and yet there's shell casings that are missing, you know, ammunition that's missing that, that wasn't accounted for. And uh, I don't know exactly how they come to the point that, that he is the, the culprit when there were numerous shooters. And But anyway, it's a case about the dishonesty. You know, they wanted me to be involved and wanted the bullet out of my shoulder to try to prove his dishonesty. To me, it's just a scapegoat uh, program. Uh, we'll be right back, folks, with Ryan Bundy on Resurrect the Republic, RTR Truth Media, Reloaded. Resurrect the Republic, Truth Radio Broadcast, RTR Truth Media, Reloaded. We have on tonight an interview that was conducted, just ended just moments before the show started. We didn't even have a chance to edit it uh, with Ryan Bundy, who's running for Nevada governor. And I can tell you, I swear, if he, if he becomes governor, I'm moving to Nevada and I'm staying there. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, we have a little bit of uh, news for you before we get back to the interview. Um, okay, 
I'm getting a message in right now. I believe Jeanette Finnegan is, is uh, going live right now. If that completes before the end, we'll give you an update. Um, uh, we do have a new uh, channel, a new video channel uh, at vid.me, or, or I'm sorry, at real uh, dot video, <laughs> real dot video, Mike Adams Network. Uh, we just established a channel on. We have a couple videos up. We're going to be uh, pretty much using it to take excerpts from uh, the show, highlights and things like that, as well as news stories. And uh, we're pretty much finished with face or with uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook. As we went live, as I was, uh, we were sharing out uh, the promo for Brian Bundy. Uh, they put me in a timeout. I'm, I'm really uh, I'm really starting to get done with this social media thing. Uh, it's it's really rather disturbing. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so you can also go to rtrtruthmedia.blogspot.com. We're going to have all of Ryan's uh, links uh, there after the show. Uh, so anyway, let's get back to Ryan Bundy running for Nevada governor. Uh, right. You know, I I haven't uh, I haven't cooperated with them by giving them the bullet uh, for several reasons. But the main reason being is that <clears throat> you know. You were charging him with attempted murder on me and the murder of Lavoie. Then mm -hmm. we're talking about a legitimate charge because that's what took place. You know, yeah. even in my case, even in my, my situation alone, you know, first of all, Lavoie, I know Lavoie was the best man ever. Hang on, you're breaking up. You still with me? I might lose you, I might lose you again. So okay, I'm sorry, you're back. back again. You're, you're you're back. Okay, because I, I got a, I'm, I'm right down in the canyon right now, so it, it might be rough. It's okay. Um, okay, so as long as we're good. Okay, with Lavoy, I mean, I know Lavoy was a very good man, and I yep. know that he is the best man that America could produce. Mm -hmm. I just know that you just can't get much better than what Lavoy is. And I yet agree. they killed him. And they, and they tried to justify it with saying, oh, well, he had a gun. Well, he darn well should have had a gun. He darn well should have been defending himself under such an attack as what they were doing. I don't believe that that's what he was doing. He had his hands in the air, and he was, uh, uh, you know, he was stuck in the snow. It's not like he could hardly even walk. He was, you know, snow up to yeah. his waist. You know, he couldn't hardly even move. I mean, what kind of attack can he make? And yet they shoot him in the back like cowards. Yep. And, you know, under those situations, after ambushing us, making an aggressive move against us when we had done no wrong, and we were in route to speak at a public meeting that was put together by the sheriff of the neighboring county. I you know, know, I mean, you know, what kind of crime were we committing, for heaven's sake? We weren't. And yet they kill him. Now, besides that point, okay, so let's say they justify Lavoie's death you know, because, you know, he was reaching for a gun, but he had the right to keep the bare arms to have. But mm -hmm. what justification did they have for putting, you know, multiple rounds into the vehicle that were triangulated to kill me in the spot that I had been sitting? Mm -hmm. And the only reason they didn't get me was because I had moved. And they still, I still took one in the shoulder. And yeah. yet I know of at least five rounds that came into that truck that were were targeted to my sitting position. Okay, uh, so what justification did they have for that? None. What justification they, they, none. did they have for that? None. Everybody, everybody who's seen the video, the only argument that I've heard made, and this is not one that I, uh, I, I cater to, but... Uh, because he came close to the one off. We saw that cop at the, at, when he hit the snow jump out in front of Lavoie's truck. It, it, he wasn't standing there and Lavoie barreled towards him. As a matter of fact, if Lavoie hadn't have swerved the way he did, he probably saved that cop's life. The idiot well, jumped out in front of his truck. That's exactly what happened. Had that guy not jumped in front of him, Lavoie was planning on... Uh, skirting around the edge of that truck and getting back on the pavement. Yeah. Because that man jumped in front of him, Lavoy turned into the snowbank to avoid hitting him. He yeah. saved that life. He saved that man's life, and it cost him his own. Yeah. 
Yeah. He saved that man's life and it cost him his own. You know, you know, if, if we were strictly just trying to get away, LaVoy should have run his, his, his run him over and kept going. Yeah. yeah but that's yeah. not what LaVoy did. That shows the goodness of LaVoy. Yeah. That shows that, that he's a man who who would not hurt another. I, I know that's what LaVoy was trying to do was to get around that vehicle. And, and you know, I, I heard it said I, uh, through this trial that the men there at the, at the roadblock um, and behind, you know, and the ambush, have mm-hmm. stated that we must kill LaVoy before he gets to Grant County. Folks, we'll be right back. Resurrect the Republic, Truth Radio Broadcast with Ryan Bundy. Welcome back. Welcome back. Resurrect the Republic Truth Radio Broadcast with Ryan Bundy. Well, LaVoy was trying to get to Grant County because he would have had the protection of the sheriff there. Mm -hmm. And I understand, I didn't know it at the time, and we didn't know it at the time, but I've heard since that the Grant County line, county line, was only another mile or so ahead of that roadblock. Wow. Another mile or so, and we would have been in Grant County. And then the, you know, the other sheriff and stuff that were working in, in conspiracy with the FBI and the uh, OSB would have mm-hmm. been out of their jurisdiction. Um, and obviously they didn't clue, you know, uh, the Grant County Sheriff in on what was going on. Otherwise, he probably would have been there to, to protect us. Yeah. Um, but as it was, uh, you know, they left him out of the uh, out of the loop because he wouldn't play their games. Yeah. And he's the only honorable. He's the only honorable sheriff in the area up there. So. Yeah, I, I, I really, I really do have a lot of respect for him. Uh, Palmer's a good man. He is a good man. Uh, we need more sheriffs like that. But, uh, you know, the office of the sheriff is very important, and we've seen these uh, coordinations, these these joint task forces. Uh, you know, um, I, a lot of researchers that I work with, we all call it what it is. It's martial law. It's not when you have uh, no separation of powers from federal law enforcement to state law enforcement to county law enforcement, and everybody's working in conjunction with each other. Who's going to act as a as a real check and balance? I do commend, um, I believe it's the Deschutes County Sheriff uh, for exposing this this lie by Astorita. I do commend them for that. Um, you know, I can't give them too much credit because they're the much. ones that uh, justified yeah. the Lavoy shooting as a you know that the yeah. Lavoy shooting that justified. Very good point. Very good point. I don't give him too much credit, but it, you know, uh, I you know, it, I really people really need to understand that proper role of, of of interposer. People don't even know what these terms mean. Interposer, checks and balances. You try. I try and talk to people about checks and balances, and well, you know, you have to be a law-abiding citizen. If you run from the cops, that means you're not a law-abiding. You, people are so brainwashed by authoritarianism, that they're, they're, they're not remembering what was fought and bled and died for and handled Well, them. the they're problem just, is, uh, is, is, is they've been taught from infants nearly to submit to authority uh, figures. Um, from kindergarten all the way through school, they're always being, you know, uh, uh, you know, stand in line, do what you're told, obey, 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 you know, you know and if you don't, then you're insubordinates and you're sent to the principal's office and and there's no you know there's no individuality there's no freedom it's all it's all all that's being taught is to submit to authority and to obey others commands yeah. and, and, and if you and do don't that if you do what you're and don't question it. yeah and do it if you do what you're told then you're good and if you have any type of individual liberty then you're, then you're subject to punishment and that's mm-hmm. what's being perpetrated in, a, in the American society continually. Yeah. And that's contrary to, you know, the precepts of liberty. Yeah. 
And, you know, I'd also like to make mention while we're here, you know, an amazing woman in Jeanette Finnegan. This, this woman who lost her husband, and now she is uh, from Red Pill Expo to Bozeman to all over these events that she has become an absolute firecracker for freedom. Um, and I just, uh, it's just amazing to me. Uh, we, we've been doing all we can to, to uh, help her keep her message out there. And, and you know, what, what, there have been a lot of uh, folks out there, we, we've always discussed this republic versus democracy. Um, we hear the mainstream media constantly, constantly puppeting. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I hate to use the term mind control. I don't, I'm not going all conspiracy theory. What I mean by mind control is you repeat the same lie over and over and over and over and over again. It starts to, to set in to the mindset of the people. And I think one of the most important aspects that we can do, one of the, you know, the folks out there at home um, is, is combat this with truth. Um, who, do you, who do you look to? Who do you, uh, uh, what can we do and, and who do you look to for good constitutional education? You know, when it comes to that subject there, uh, go online and find Stephen Pratt. Stephen Pratt taught uh, great uh, seminars, and they're all recorded. You can find them on YouTube. And he goes over that uh, democracy versus republic very well. The mm -hmm. other one is uh, there's, a, there's a video and uh, it's by John F. McManus. And oh, yes, McManus. He, Yes, and he does a, a program uh, called uh, An Overview of Our World. Now, he does, there's several versions of it because he's given a seminar several times that's been recorded. The one I have is on VHS, a little bit older, and it's like three hours long, and it's awesome, absolutely awesome. But he, mm -hmm. he goes through the process of the different forms of government. Uh, you know, there's, of course, anarchy and a republic and then a democracy, and then an oligarchy, and then a, uh, a monarchy. And so those I, are the, the... I just saw yeah. that last week. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. yeah, awesome stuff. And so, and so he goes into detail and explains the different types of governments in the world. And, you know, our founding fathers did not set up a democracy. They set up a republic. And in the Constitution, under Article 4, we are guaranteed a republic form of government. But most people don't even understand the difference between a republic and a democracy. And so oh, they, yeah. they, they melt, melt the term saying, oh, well, it's a, cost, it's a democratic republic or you know, and stuff. Well, no, that, that doesn't work, you know. It's either a republic or it's a democracy. Now, that doesn't yeah. mean in a republic we don't use the process of voting uh, to elect our you know, representatives. Right. Democratically, Demo we're democratically elected constitutional republic. Well, you know, and I don't even know if you want to use you know, the word democrat there. You know, again, uh, just because we use, you know, a process of voting doesn't make this a democracy. That's right. Uh, yeah. You know, but a republic, uh, you know, again, that John F. McManus does the very best. He just explains it so well. So I, I encourage everyone who's listening to this program to go find that. And uh, uh, I have not probably been able to find We're going to be running it right after. I'm going to be seeding it into this show. Okay. <laughs> and again, I don't know which version or which, uh, you know, the one you have. The one, the one I have on DHS is the very best one I've seen. The mm -hmm. others aren't done as well, and I and I certainly hope to have them. I haven't been able to find the version I have on PHS anywhere online, um, right. but either way, uh, I hope that you find it. Um, yeah, you know, my favorite part uh, of his presentation was explaining the difference between a democracy and a republic when when describing uh, a mob uh, setting upon uh, somebody who who committed a crime. The mob says, "Oh, night." Nine out of ten in the mob say, let's hang him, so he hangs, and that's a democracy. A uh, republic is when the, the sheriff shows up and says, no, he's coming with me, and he's going to go be tried and, and have a jury and have due process, and if he's determined guilty, they'll make their mind up what to do with him. That's the difference. 
that the fundamental difference is the rule of law as opposed to mob rule. That's correct. And that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the main difference between a, a republic. A republic is founded upon and established upon a solid set of principles. Now, granted, a republic could be set on you know, incorrect principles. Mm -hmm. But, you know, of course, in our republic, the principles are established in our Constitution. So our Constitution is that rock upon which our republic is founded. Um, right. And, of course, that's based upon Judeo-Christian values, you know, the Ten Commandments, and, and uh, right. you know, principles, the uh, Magna Carta, and, and other, other previously established sound doctrines that predate uh, predecessors our Constitution. But our Constitution espouses all of those principles, sure. and, and it's supposed to be a rock. That's why it's not easily amended. I mean, yeah, there is a process to amend it, but it's not an easy process. And that's okay. how it be. Now, a democracy, especially a pure democracy, is, is fluid. There's no solid ground. It's basically mob rule. It's, there's 51% want it, therefore it is. And yeah. they're paying, you know, at the detriment to the, to the 49. And, and that's just not... You know, as, as I've heard it described, that democracy is an ever turbulent uh, contention. Um, and in a democracy, you know, never lasts because as soon as they, as soon as six one percent of the people can decide they can vote themselves the largesse of their treasury, so to speak, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, that's what happens in the country collapses. Well, this is history, history repeating itself. It's how uh, the Roman Republic fell. It's how Greece fell. It's when, when the politicians start giving away everything, uh, everybody else's stuff and stuff that they don't have to get into office. The, fa the fabric of society collapses. The, the, the rule of law collapses. Um, and, and then you just try and pander to the majority. And it's been in the history of the world. It's brought down every great civilization. Yes. It has. Hey, uh, Thomas, I'm going to have to draw this to a uh, uh, conclusion. No, uh, for thank the you day. very much. Thank you very much, and, and we thank you for being with us uh, at Resurrect the Republic here. God bless you, brother. I'm praying for you, and, sure. and God, I'd love to see you as governor. And do me a well, favor uh, and, and, get, and tell your wife, God bless her, too. She's been great. Love her post. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Now, before I go, though, and on the, on the note of my candidacy, Sure. Uh, you know, I, 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 it is hit to the time where I'm apt to you know, purchase signs and billboards and advertisements. Mm -hmm. I, need to, I need some funding to do that, and I, okay. I need some donations. I, I do not, I'm not like President Trump. I don't have the, the funds to, for, you know, to, to do all that on my own. I just don't. It would be nice if I did, but I don't. Right. And so I, I, I'd like to ask your listeners if they will send me some money. Uh, to fund my campaign, uh, mm -hmm. so that I can take, get there and be in this position of ability to make these changes we need. So, if, okay. if someone's willing to, to donate, I, I ask that they please do so by sending me a direct mail to, and I'll give you my address, which is 361 Riverside Road, in Mesquite, Nevada. That's uh, okay. 361 Riverside Road, Mesquite, Nevada. And send, you know, check money order or whatever you possibly can. And, uh, you know, hey, I could use some, uh, the largest donation an individual is allowed to make in Nevada is $5,000. I should cer can certainly use a few $5,000 checks. Or any denomination uh, less than that would be also appreciated. No, absolutely. Is there is there some form of electronic way that they can get to you, a link or? Um, yes, there uh, is. <clears throat> they could go to my website, which is uh, ryanbundygovernor.com, and there is a donate page there. Um, the money is donated that direction or subject to some you know fees and percentages, which that diminish the value thereof. But hey, okay. that's part of the process. So if they send it to me by mail, I can utilize all 100% of it. Yes, right. 
Um, okay, but, so your preferred method, your, your preferred method would be your address at 361 Riverside Drive, Mesquite, Nevada, uh, or yeah, Riverside Road. Yes. Right at the uh, uh, Riverside Road. Yes, and if and if people can't do it that way, RyanBundyGovernor.com. Okay. Yes. And folks, we'll put this these links on uh, RTRTruthMedia.blogspot.com as well. Um, we'll have a little Ryan Bundy for Governor section up there with all of Ryan's links uh, and the address. I, I I urge all of my listeners to do so. It doesn't matter what state. Here's another thing doesn't matter what state you're in if we can get if, if we can this this would be a win for nevada i believe it would be a win for all of us because it's a start it's really a start yeah, the, the donations do have to come from one of the states of the union it can't come from a state not belonging to the union so right. that's the only description right well thank you very much for for joining us today and and we'll do all we can to to help you and uh certainly We'll pray for you. Do you mind if you can close us out in a prayer? I can do that, yes. So Thank if you. you're ready, I will begin. I am. <sighs> Father in heaven, we come before thee and give thee thanks for this day and for all that thou hast given us. And we are thankful for all the goodness that we have. We ask thee that thou would be with us to Help us choose right from wrong. Help us to know right from wrong. Help us to have the courage and the strength to choose the right, regardless of what consequences might follow. Father in heaven, we ask you that thou would bless us and preserve our freedom. That thou would place those in office that will do so. That will recognize our rights and protect them. Father in heaven, we love thee. We thank thee for thy gospel. We're thankful for the prophets and apostles that have led us and guided us. And we thank thee for all that thou have given us. we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And thank you for joining us, Ryan. We're with you. Okay, thanks, Tom. All right, you have a great night. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Bundy. Um, just uh, in a few moments, uh, Mike, let me know when we can do that with the update. Um, I think we'll be covering it on the next uh, the next segment. Uh, we'll have an update on USV Astorita with Jeanette Finnicum and the Center for Self Governance. We'll be right back. Resurrect the Republic Truth Radio broadcast. Um, my name's Ryan Bundy. I'm the son of Clive and Bundy. I assume you know who we are. And uh, I'm very fond of your father, Rand, so that's glad you're here. I see here, when you talk about civil liberties, I pulled up some information on you, and it says that, uh, you know, the usurpation of power by our current federal government would make our founding fathers roll over in their graves, and I believe you're right. Um, you know, the issues that, the standoff and so forth that took place here a year ago, which brought me to light some important things. Um, one major thing is that there is simply no place in the United States Constitution that allows the federal government to own land, period. What are you going to do as president to correct that problem? I'd either sell or turn over all the land management to the states. I don't think the federal government needs to be involved in that. Biggest revenue raisers for the Treasury back in like the 1830s, 1840s was selling Western land. That's how a lot of our ancestors got here, is through land sales. And it was pretty cheap to buy land from the federal government. But we run into problems now with the federal government being, um, you know, this um, bully and this big, huge government bully. You would have less of that if you had more local control of land. State ownership would be better, but even better would be private ownership. And so I think we should do everything possible. Like all the stuffs that you had to deal with, with the, the grouse or the prairie chicken or the, the bigger chicken, the lesser chicken, and all that stuff, you wouldn't have that problem if you were dealing with it locally. Because what you would decide is, well, yeah, we want to preserve nature, but we also want to preserve jobs and the economy, and there would be a balance. And um, sometimes I'll say flippantly, if you sold the chicken to somebody, there'd be plenty of them. And there's certain truth to that. When things are owned, there's lots of cows. No, cows are not endangered. These are chickens, really. 
sagebrush, you know, grouse are, would be probably less likely to be endangered if somebody owned it and re made it, allowed it to reproduce. So there are ways of handling it, but we've actually taken the Endangered Species Act and we say that that should be done in one state also. And then, then it would be your community, you decide what to do. And there still would be arguments back and forth over exactly what we do on how we protect species. But we just went crazy on all this stuff. In Kentucky, we have the pocketbook muscle. And so it was a little tiny town. And when it rained, their sewage plant was small enough that the sewage, the raw sewage, would go into the lake. Well, nobody wanted that. I don't care whether you're a Republican or Democrat. Nobody wants sewage in the lake. So they said, we're going to build a bigger sewage plant. The federal government came and said, oh, no, you don't. We need to find out with the bigger sewage plant, how it will affect the pocketbook muscle that grows in the lake. And it's like, we're trying to prevent stuff from going in the lake. But they end up spending $100,000, this tiny little town that had no money, on a consultant to count the sagebrush, uh, the, not the sagebrush, the uh, pocketbook muscle. Then they found an arrowhead, and then they had to do an archaeological dig. <laughs> so the government's gone way too far. I'll tell you one other story about what the government's done and what, how the government can really be a bully. Robert Lucas was a landowner in the southern part of Mississippi who was developing lots, and he decided to put dirt on his lots to improve the elevation of the lots. The government came and said, oh, no, it's a wetland. And he said, well, there's no water. There's 300 different ways that the government can tell you have a wetland. 300 different plants that they can look for. They can take a soil sample and measure the percentage of water in the soil. They don't have to see water for it to be a wetland. They also can turn leaves over. If the leaves are black on the bottom, you might have a wetland. So here's the problem. The government took something reasonable. And I'm not against all government regulations. There was a Clean Water Act in the 70s that says you can't discharge pollutants into an navigable stream. Well, I don't want people dumping benzene into Lake Tahoe or the Mississippi River. Most of us don't want that. But the thing is, over time, they define dirt as a pollutant and your backyard as a navigable stream. So the government just grew so large and became such a bully on this. But anyway, Robert Lucas did this. They put him in jail for 10 years for putting dirt on his own land. They convicted him on the RICO Act, which is supposed to be used for like gangsters and drug dealers. His daughter was 43 and never, ever committed any crime with speeding ticket. Had a two-year-old daughter at home. She had 84 months in jail. They let her out after 26 months, and over two years in prison, for just trying to sell lots and be an entrepreneur in our country. So we have gone way too far, and it is time that we stand up in a legal fashion, but we stand up and let's say enough's enough. Let's elect people who will get the government off our back. Today in the courtroom, and um, I've already flown to Phoenix for the Snowflake event that's tomorrow. We're going to um, premiere the or show Lavoy Dead Man Talking Episode 1 <laughs> at, in Snowflake. So I'm pretty excited about that. I get to see Senator Sylvia Allen and Cope Reynolds and all of my friends there in Snowflake, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, but the update on the court proceedings today, very interesting day, very interesting day. We had uh, a Victoria, who was a medical examiner, very professional, um, uh, very right spot on. You could tell she was just giving you the facts. I really appreciated that. We had um, other officers testify. Um, it was very interesting. Uh, some of the things that came out from the testimony of these particular officers that were uh, Deschutes County investigators and detectives that were tasked with uh, doing the investigation for the crime scene there. Um, one of the roadblock vehicles that the two officers were, officers were in, uh, I believe it was the OSP officers that had one of these vehicles, they left the scene without marking the truck. Amazing, who does that? Who messes with a crime scene to that degree? You know, they, they had to kind of estimate where to put those truck lines next. The crime scene tape didn't go up for hours. They did not secure that site for hours. 
it was nine hours. Mark's reminding me, nine hours before they secured that scene. So much, so much tampered with. Oh my goodness. You have, we watch video after video of these officers walking around. The plane above is using their infrared camera and filming them searching the ground with their head with their um, flashlight on the end of their gun looking for shell casings looking for they said spoons and pens and and flash bombs because they wanted to pick up sensitive material items because they didn't want anybody to get hurt was their testimony however when you put the expert on who is the trainer for um, these men in the HRT unit, they testify over and over again about how you do not pick up anything from a, a crime scene. You just don't do that. It, you're compromising the integrity of the scene. Over and over again, we heard testimony of how many different ways they compromise this crime scene. Nine hours before it was taped off, vehicles moved, men out there searching for material and picking things up and you can clearly see that oh my gosh you guys and they want me to believe that they didn't plant that gun on my husband uh, yeah they did yeah they did anyways there was also testimony by the examiner that when she arrived there there was a well-worn hard packed snow path from my husband's body to the passenger door of that truck, of his truck. That's key because I think that that gun could have been on the dash between the blanket. That's my, my thinking. And because he carried it there often. Two magazines. And, and I think that they could have easily put it in his pocket with the nine hours they had to mess around with that crime scene, which they were doing. They were breaking protocol by walking around in that scene over and over and over again. Yes, what an interesting day. Very interesting day. I am grateful for the friends that continue to follow this story and that continue to support me in every single way that you are. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you're interested in helping me with the legal battle that we are having, please go to OneCowboyStanfordFreedom.com and I have a legal fund button there. You're welcome to contribute there or if you want to send me a message, I can get it through there. We also have a newsletter that you can sign up for so that if I'm not doing these updates, you can get a written newsletter of, of my updates. But again, thank you. Thank you for your support. God bless you all. Talk to you Monday.